The Union of Minority Neighborhoods began a Boston busing desegregation project that originated when our program Black People for Better Public Schools attempted to organize African American parents to be more engaged with the Boston public school system. Our reasons are simple. Our work has taught us that scores of people had been harmed by the events of that time, and we found no small amount of pain and anger around Boston school desegregation in general and busing in particular. I lived in Charlestown and uh, was entering middle school, fourth and fifth grade, um, in a neighborhood school, Harvard Kent. At, at that particular time, I wasn't bused out of my neighborhood. I would, I was always nervous when the buses would come in in the morning and the the parents and the older people, like you know, marching and protesting against the buses coming in. And I just thought it was terrible that. These kids were so afraid to come to school. And... It was just a real bad experience. Um, taking a bus and um, getting on the bus, going to school, and you know, riding down the street, and you got on both sides of the street, which that was Metropolitan Ave, I think. Um, you know, all the parents are outside, and you know, they have their fists up, pointing their finger, you know, middle fingers up, and giving racial slurs out, and I mean, it was just awful, really. It was awful, I mean, it was kind of traumatizing. I was just leaving middle school, going to a local high school, which was the Jerry Mighty Burt School on Washington Street in Dorchester. And we all um, got promoted into that high school together. The first few semesters, we were having fun. We, we knew this was gonna be a, a, a great experience high school together and then all of a sudden we were told that we were going to be bussed out they're going to separate us and it was just a scary feeling from that point. When I got on the bus to go to Rosendale High that first year and we were on the bus and we're looking out the window and you got all these white people standing outside in front of the school and they're yelling and screaming and they got signs up and it's like what the heck is going on here? I mean, you know, because we didn't, we got on the bus without, you know, we got dressed up for school, ready to go to school kind of thing. And we, we get there and all these people was shouting and writing in. Okay, now we're kind of like scared to get off the bus. Schools in West Roxbury, Hyde Park, Roslindale, and Jamaica Plain do not report any incidents. Overall attendance throughout the city is at 67.7%. So I was in my last year of high school, I was 16 years old, um, going to Dorchester High and then when the whole busing crisis hit, um, I had to go to my neighborhood school. Um, so for me it was, you know, devastating because I wanted to graduate from Dorchester High, all my friends were there, um, but because of busing, um, I got relocated. The change was there was a culture in East Boston that there was a large number of folks who were going to be displaced. And that was what the big issue was, is like, we're not going to have those black, not you. You're not one of them. You're, you're our East Boston black. Okay? And then that was cool. Busing was not you because you're one of our East Boston niggers. So busing all of a sudden created this term nigger, 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 nigger over and over and over again. And, and, and the thing that busing did do is it created this chaos 
that there was a subset of folks, not the holy spots, that acted crazy, and a subset of folks ended up firebombing my family and a bunch of other families from Maverick because at that point, for some reason, they didn't want blacks in East Boston. As soon as we would turn the corner to the street the school was off of, you would have anywhere from four-year-olds to 80-year-olds all lined up on their porches, literally going down the street. What, I guess they must have buckets of rocks, I don't know, because they were always just, every morning just went on hailing rocks at us. So we knew we had to like get down or whatever once we got around that area. It was time to get down on the floor or lower, you know, in the seat so that you wouldn't get hurt. I can't tell you how many times people have been injured on a bus. The buses brought us to the, through South Boston. Now, you know, we have, you know, we have people, you know, grown people, young people. They're in there, they come out of their houses, they're in there. Night clothes on the porch, you know, niggas go on this, that, that, the other, you know. Me as an individual, I have a lot of people who I respect them. They're probably even older than me, and uh, they, they said, "Mickey, I can't believe this. What are you doing out here? You should quit. How do you quit a, a, a job when you get five kids?" And I didn't like that, but I I didn't react to it. I said, "Well, somebody has to be here. That's why we're here. You know, preserve the peace and." and we'll have to be here. Uh, it got really, uh, got very emotional a lot of times too, you know? Very, very emotional. Boston police arrest five white youths on disorderly conduct charges. In response to the bus stoning, Mayor White bans crowds near schools in South Boston. He also requests the assistance of Governor Sargent and puts police on the Strandway along Day Boulevard. Boston to me means, to me is a derogative term. Uh, it was used against us, people of color in this city, to minimize the, the, uh, the desegregation plan put in by the federal court and Judge Garrity. It, it was a political game, that's what it was. Looking at it now, uh, to diminish our involvement, not to make it important, uh, but it was very important at the time. It was, our children were not getting the same treatment, the same resources, uh, the, the nice books, the nice uh, buildings, as other children were. Not that the other children did not deserve it, they were all poor. In the role of school bus driver, in some ways I had the a, a additional privilege of being able to be a natural ally, even with the kids. Because I was, you're right, I was picking up black kids from Roxbury, taking them to Columbia Point where we lined up in a caravan and waited for the police escort to bring us into Southie where there was still some, some bad times, some rough times, some rock throwing and all that kind of stuff. One of the things that people don't say about the side effects of the busing situation is that some of the racism was stirred even further by the fact that poor white people who could not escape were then left behind. And those who tried to escape and could not then moved out of the city. I need to say something about the fact that the only term that I hear today in reference to that momentous historical occasion is the term busing. And I have a conniption fit when I hear it because it was a term that was coined by the very people who practiced the racist behavior of excluding us from, from, uh, from having good, a good education. Like there's a generation of young people who are like, that had not, you know, busing had nothing to do with me. You know, why should I feel the effects of uh, a flawed system? You know, I deserve a, a quality education. And then there's another set of young people um, who don't realize that they're kind of be, being affected by the effects of busing. Um, you know, and, and even there's a generation of parents too, like who, a lot of young parents who um, 
are also affected by busing. My mother's response was very much seeing herself as completely different than the people who were in South Boston, although I am Irish Catholic and my extended family, frankly, uh, lived in urban areas, including in the Boston area, um, and were working class people. To see her talk about them as though they um, were racist, but not coming to grips at looking at um, our living in a town that was 99% white, and that it, within my grade school, the only um, kids of color, there were two kids of color I remember in fourth grade, got bussed in to go to my school. Um, and so that's really, really my memory of it. NAACP President Thomas Atkins again urges black parents to send their children to school. However, he continues his recommendation that black parents with children assigned to South Boston schools keep their children home in light of rock throwing and other violence against buses entering the area. I mean, every day we went to school, the, the, the parents was outside. Then um, getting out off the bus, um, you had police officers all over the place. Then um, going up into the school building, we had to go to, through metal detectors. And that means they have to search you, they have to search your bags, and you know, it was like not going to school. That wasn't like going to school. I can recall a time um, we was leaving from the school, going home, and rocks were being thrown in. Um, a rock hit this, I always talk about this because it's finger when I talk about it, I can feel it. The rock hit my finger and it, you know, I immediately ducked and not knowing that the kid sitting in the seat to me, the rock went in his eye. Um, and that was just, you know, when you're 14 years old, seeing stuff like this early in the morning, going to school every day like this, it, it, it does a number on you, mentally and emotionally. Being in Charlestown, I, you know, for me personally, when it got out that I was making all these new friends and black friends, I, I kind of became an outcast in, in my neighborhood. And, you know, kids wouldn't play with me anymore and, you know, got called the nigga lovers and all the bad, you know, it, it, it got kind of bad for me. It, it was really frightening to see that you got not just the kids, but parents. It's like, you know, why are you all out here with kids? You know, I think I might have been 15, 14, 15 years old or something. And My mother was at home thinking I'm going to school and I'm going to be safe. So it was kind of like frightening that first first day of school. Yeah, there's police and horses, police everywhere, police and the helicopters. There's all this stuff when you get off the bus and you're rushed off the bus into the school. And then when you get in school, there's metal detectors. You had to go through the metal detectors. And virtually once we got in the school, then it's just rioting. So, and it's getting through the metal detectors and get into your classroom safely. Sometimes they just, they just ushered us right back out the door because they couldn't get couldn't get the rioting under control. So, or you're rioting and it's, you know, maybe an hour this is going on before they get everything under the control, get you into, people into classrooms, um, not your classroom, but any classroom. <laughs> Black and white Protestant ministers offered to ride buses from South Boston to Roxbury and Dorchester schools. I mean, it was traumatic and it was um, incredibly difficult as you know, you can imagine um, from middle school, the same group of kids I was in in middle school, which was actually the Oliver Wendell Homes, Dorchester High was literally right around the corner. Um, so these are middle school friends, you know, you then um, get into high school with your friends. Um, and so it was difficult. Um, it felt like a family was being split up. Um, and going to a new school where I really didn't know anyone, 
Um, it was my last year, so trying to um, get into the groove of things and you know, really enjoy your last year of high school was very difficult because it you just felt displaced. Well, when there was a group of us from the same housing project where I grew up that all went to the school. And so when we went to this school, we were kind of facing the same issues that the black students were facing because they were prejudiced against us because we came from the projects in Charlestown and we must all be thugs and bad kids and poor kids. And so we faced that prejudice from, from those kids. So I kind of really got a sense then of, wow, this is what they were really dealing with, you know. Those kids that went to those other schools, suddenly, you know, like imagine, again, being a junior, you thought you, thought you were, you know, the following year you're going to be a senior. Uh, those were all tough. But then what really hurt is education was no longer important, or if it was, uh, there's no way that some people would send those kids into another neighborhood. Anti-busing demonstration in East Boston, including the picketing of East Boston High School. Attendees include groups from East Boston, South Boston, and Charlestown. The other thing that was different was is, is, it wasn't as much the classroom, it was what was happening outside the classroom. Because you would look outside the window and see like thousands of people, not just your classmates, but families and others, you know, tipping over buses, you know, you know, yelling and screaming. And you're looking out and you're looking and saying, damn, you know, that's my boy. And then they'd have to almost sneak into school to get credit. But then we'd have football practice. And at football practice, the same dude that was protesting, rallying outside, they're blocking for you. I knew it was trouble, but when I experienced it head on, I was completely devastated. I was scared to death. Um, we got on the bus, you know, everybody knew that they were going to fight. They just knew they were getting ready to battle. And I was like, wow, what is this? You know, going on, we had to fight. And I was, so I didn't think anything of it. Um, when I got into the the um, school itself, it was a lot of state troopers, doors barricaded. I, I noticed um, in that community, a lot of families were on their roofs with, I don't know if it was BB guns, shotguns, real guns. I was petrified. We were escorted into school and escorted out of the school. I couldn't think, I couldn't focus. I just knew that I was gonna quit. I wasn't gonna go through this, I couldn't do it. The teachers that were there to teach us, I can recall there was times we had a teacher that would um, sneak to teach us black history. We were, he wasn't able to tell us different things about our, our history. He would have to sneak and tell it. Uh, it was just a continuous thing. Police would be in the hallways like we were in prison or something. Like outside of the classroom, we'd be a police officer maybe every four or five classes. And they'd be like, monkeys, get to your class. I mean, it was just continuous racial abuse, continuously. It had a big impact on me because to me, I, I was cheated. I mean, I, I, to me, I didn't get an education. I didn't learn, you know, to my full capacity. I mean, and um, as a mother now, um, when I did have my kids, I, would, I didn't want them at Boston Public School um, because of that. So um, I sent my, school, my kids to Catholic school. I started them off in Catholic school. I enrolled them um, on the Metco program and I, I had them stay into Catholic school until they got, you know, received into Mecca. Violence occurs in the South Boston High School cafeteria. 10 people are injured and three students are arrested for throwing trays. And I, hate, I hated it. I hated it because I never felt accepted. I never felt appreciated for, um, you know, my academics, and I, I, I just felt like we were pushed to the side and, and not worked with, and, and we were always, like, scolded, and you know, it was terrible. It was a terrible experience for me, and that kind of threw me off loving school because I did love school. I loved going to school every day, and going there, I, like, hated it, and it kind of turned me around um, as far as my education. So. The education we received back then was limited. Um, I mean, we had the basic math, English, history, 
you know, um, then uh, uh, I had sewing and typewriting and things like that, which was things that I liked doing. So honestly, for me, I, I didn't really have a problem with learning it um, or adjusting to it. Um, so, nah, it didn't really bother me because I knew I had to go to school to learn. That's what I was going there for. When I was young, it was all about race because we didn't, I didn't know anything around education. As I've gotten older, I realized it was around quality education. It's around access, it's around fairness, it's about availability. The atmosphere was terrible. They had the whites on one side, the blacks on the other. Um, you know, everybody, you know, the, the race stayed to their self and, you know, it was a lot of tension, a lot of tension. And you had your troublemakers that would start, the black, some black kids start trouble with the white kids, some white kids start trouble with the black kids. And as soon as <clears throat> one little incident that the teacher would, um, <clears throat> the teacher would hear, um, if they thought a fight was going to break out, they would call the, the principal and before we know it, they're telling us um, the buses are coming to take us to Lena Park. And when we get to school, they made us stand outside in the rain because the kids were blocking it and they told us we couldn't come in. This morning, we, it was an all out riot because the police literally came and literally took us as the ones that were being aggressive and it wasn't us being aggressive but we were standing out in the rain and I'm talking about for like an hour we was out in the rain and we tried to go somewhere there was a, a store that we used to be able to go into and when we got there that morning the guy told us he didn't want any niggas in his store anymore we couldn't come in there anymore to buy goods for the school we was trying to find a place for shelter you know because like I said it was pouring rain out the buses had already left us there so again here's another morning I gotta call my mother to come get me she has to leave work this continuously and I'm repeating myself because this is how it was. It was a repeated process. It went on and on and on. And my, my focus now looking back at that, I was cheated out of school. Off the bus, some went on straight to the hospital. Some was um, dealing with a lot of trauma to the face from the stones being thrown. I was shaken, emotionally distraught. Um, I told my mom, my family, um, I am not going to go back to school. I refuse to get back on that bus. I'm not going to lose my life for high school. And she said, okay. So you had to do something. So all the pioneers from, if it's, you know, John O'Brien, Mel King, um, you know, Juanita Wade, Carmen Pola, you know, for me, the Mickey Roaches, uh, all these pioneers, they had to do something because it was unfair that black children weren't getting access to the same quality education as someone from Beacon Hill, West Roxbury, and others. The first thing I did was to pull my children out of the public school system and put them in Catholic school. And uh, you might think, why did you get involved? Because as far as I'm concerned, when there is a person of color in trouble, I'm going to be there. That's the way God made me. Uh, and I, I felt free, free, more free to be involved without jeopardizing my children's education out of the system. Uh, the system was extremely cruel. It was um, many kids, parents, or they didn't know what grade they were in. Um, as I got involved with the system, I got in many committees. I found many, particularly African-American children, 19, 20 years old in high school that didn't know what grade they were in. It, it, it was real terrible. Hyde Park and Roslindale black students boycott school. Violence occurs at Mission Hill in Roxbury. 38 are injured, 24 whites and 14 blacks. People who had the means found a way to uh, get their children into private school, 
uh, for black people who had the means. They went through Medco to do integration, not in the city, but into the suburbs as a way of accessing uh, quality education. And so those people of means were able to escape the side effects. And the construct of what happened and the dynamic of what happened with the busing situation after the initial 10 years of trying to give the system time to do equity, it became a part of the destruction. Black families loved the idea of education, what they do with their kids. They knew it better than anybody, but they couldn't get it. And they were willing to even bus in, uh, they were willing to go to bus in 1968. But the school committee, they didn't want to pay for it. So they knew if you got to a white school, I'm saying temporarily, not that they, these aren't bright kids or, or could be, but it wasn't there for them. We didn't go there because we thought the only way that we could learn is to sit with white children. That was the only choice that we were given. And after all of the efforts that were made by operations such as METCO and Ellen Jackson through the exodus effort were, were thwarted, particularly Ellen Jackson's exodus effort, after those were, th were thwarted, the NAACP decided that it was going to take some action and take this to a higher level, i.e. taking it to the court process. Mm -hmm. and, and it was out of the hands of the school department. It was out of the hands of the citizen parents at that point. And the only thing that any judge could do in order to uh, change the desegregated, I'm, I'm sorry, in order to change the segregated school system in, in Boston was to issue a court order that said desegre uh, desegregation must happen and uh, it must happen um, immediately, essentially. Every student entering Hyde Park High School is searched by faculty members. I never understood why we had to leave where we was and why it just wasn't brought to us. Why wasn't education brought to us? Why wasn't it good books in our school? Why did the teachers have to sneak and teach us different, you know, subjects? Or, you know, why was I being abused most verbally by teachers or police officers or people that are authority figures who are supposed to be protecting me were against me? And as a child, you look for protection from the authority figure as opposed to being fearful of them. And that's what happened. And like I said, it, it, it makes you angry to know that you can't go to school. We didn't have the opportunity to go to school that were in our neighborhood that we felt comfortable in. And going to this school that we were forced to go to, you know, to get better educated, and we were giving the same type of education that we had at Nuremberg, I mean, what was the point? All we got, like I said, was an attitude. We got angry because we had to see these people yell, scream, throw up signs, and we had to fight and just to go to school in the morning. You can't force people to do things. And, um, and I just, you know, I, I don't think it's like racist in the sense. I think that they were just protecting theirs, their culture, their community, their school. That was theirs. All these years, it was theirs. They didn't, that's where everybody went, you know, and that's the thing, you know. Their teachers were like, yep, yeah, I'll meet you at the pub after school. Blah, 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 blah. This is the way they talk. This, this is the way it was there. So I didn't think in terms of, oh, yeah, you know, they're against us because we're here, but that's, that's just the way it is. Three white youths are arrested near Hyde Park High School with Molotov cocktails in their car. The three are charged in federal court by the Justice Department with conspiring to injure black students. I think busing was the unthought out, unprepared, unplanned um, decision that the community made because actually, um, I think it failed us as teenagers, it failed us as um, the children that had to be put on the front line um, to make it happen. Um, we lost um, education. We lost the, the most important part of our education, which is the basics, the basic math, the basic writing, the basic of English. 
you can't get those things back. Even if you did take classes, it's just, you know, you're not able to get it back. Um, the experience of um, the prom and, and the high school, the whole high school experience. The whole, the whole issue, it, it stopped being about, we don't want our children going to the other side of town. It became more of a race thing. And I think for the whole situation, that was the worst part of it. If it was just the kids were switching sides of town to go to school and left at that, then that's an issue because no, everybody wants their child close by. So, so that's that, but it, it, it became not about that anymore. It just became about hatred and, and racism. Instead of, instead of moving the, the students and out of where they live, why don't you bring the right materials to the, where they live? Give them the right stuff that they need to learn to educate themselves. You know, every, if, if, if Metco has certain equipment, so should Dorchester, or so should Roxbury. And then they're all getting the same kind of education. Get the teachers that want to help teach. Busing, I hated it. I hope it never happens again. Nothing in this world is perfect. Uh, many of us felt that sometimes that we built a pink, I used to say a pink elephant, uh, in some issues. But the fact that many of our black professionals could not work in the system until the federal law came, to me, was a very important thing to bring in black and Latino teachers, black and Latino principals, uh, to be in the decision making at the top as deputy superintendents, because uh, we never had that. Um, it gave a different flavor to the classrooms too. I don't know who crafted that idea, but I think that, you know, I think it's good that you're talking about it because people should have been talking about it before to, to you know, what's the, and what was the impact? What, you know, because they impact a lot of people's lives, disruption of community, ch children's lives, you know, people went to court, people was arrested, people, I was brought to court, uh, you know. Um, you know, just so much disruption and, and all this money that went into doing this forced busing thing. And, you know, what, what was the impact and, you know, who benefited? And who benefited from this? I'm not sure. The idea, again, like of busing and young pe people having to be bussed out or, you know, that in order to receive a quality education, we should be afforded the opportunity to go wherever we wanted versus like, you know, fortifying the schools in the neighborhoods that we do have or fighting. I mean, I'm not saying that people didn't fight. I'm not saying that at all. But I think just the idea that there's a lack in our communities, right? There's an insufficiency. There's a need. And um, instead of making the investment here, we go outside to find other things. And I think that that ultimately is the effect of busing. A black and white student get into a fight outside William Barton Rogers School in Hyde Park. The black student is suspended. 50 to 75 students refuse to enter the school. When you're describing what the, the hope of the uh, people of color, African Americans, blacks, were that they would have greater resources in their schools, and then they landed up with busing, as a solution, um, it makes you wonder why. And I can't answer that question why, because I don't know enough of the history, but what did they think was gonna be the response if they took people out of their neighborhoods? Because within cities as well in New England, there is that idea, you go to your neighborhood school, that there's, there's a community there, and you're a part of that community. We found that the, that the children in South Boston were in fact getting a worse education in many respects 
than the, 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 the children in Roxbury. If not worse, no better. So they didn't do us any favors to send us to South Boston. They could have sent us to West Roxbury or even Roslindale at that point in time. But they didn't. They sent us to South Boston where they had to know that there would be a clash. We, they already knew that the racial thing, the racial uh, um, animosity was uh, um, um, a factor in South Boston, as was the case in Charlestown, for example. Uh, so it was almost a deliberate uh, vote for failure to send black children to South Boston. I knew that education, op educational opportunity and educational resources were unequal and that institutional racism and historical racism was at the bottom of that. Um, and so integration was going to be the only way that was going to equalize. Until there was white kids in the school, the schools in the communities of color were going to be less than. Um, and I don't think that was, that was wrong. And then again, we were like, why do I have to leave up from my neighborhood to go to another school? And we know over the long run, really, all the schools sucked. I wish they could have figured it out later. It's like any plan, I've always said, anything I've ever done, I always start off very incrementally. We kind of test the waters. But yet, I have to also say, how long can you wait? And at some point, somebody had to make a decision, which I think ultimately is going to be the best thing ever happened. Unfortunately, a lot of people, there's been a lot of pain for everybody, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, and all kinds of folks. And we went to, for lack of a better word, it was surreal. This is where the problem comes in. You get up the next day, you have no school to go to, your parents are at work, and this is where all the risky behavior comes in. Your, your experiment with unprotected sex, you're, you're trying marijuana, you're having little parties at your house, you're, you're, just, you're just doing just bad behavior because it's, you're unsupervised. Um, and then the outcome of it was an early pregnancy. Um, teen pregnancy facing that, it was um, addiction. It, it just was a long list of after effects that really turned my life the wrong way um, until I actually got myself back on track. But it did start that I can recall from that point of saying I wasn't gonna go back to high school. It was very ugly, very negative, um, nasty. Um, I think it was very clear um, saying that um, black children weren't good enough um, to go to, um, quote, a white neighborhood. Um, and, and I find it ironic because these are poor neighborhoods um, then in terms of, you know, Charlestown, um, East Boston, South Boston. And so, you know, it's I, the busing was really about integration, that people have a right to go to school where they um, want to go to school. Um, but it's not like we were being bused out to Wellesley or Lexington and you know, other communities where the education system was at a much higher level. There are improvements. And I think that some of those improvements are actually documented through the increasing number of students that are graduating that can pass that uh, crazed um, MCAS thing that they have tried to make culturally competent, which will never be, but that's what is there to test there. And, and I think that those things, we should not diminish the accomplishments that have been made. I think that the uh, racial biases that are with that are entrenched within the system i want to I, I do not have a suggestion of how you undo that i really don't boston school committee meets for the first briefing session on the school department's plan for long-range desegregation to be implemented in fall 1975. do you know that thing that people say you know some things happen in cycles if we don't have this conversation about race, we're coming back. 
this is one of those cycles that we don't want to repeat. And I think what we could learn is that this issue of race and ethnicity is real. This issue of geography is real. This issue of disparity still in education is real. This issue in perceptions of age, geography is real. And, and again, and why we're having this conversation today is because the conversation is still relevant today as it was back then. So I guess in a very simple end, we had an issue back then that we didn't resolve. So it's almost like the issue continues. For the generation of the people that went through it, I think it's a lot of healing that need to, need to be taking place. I haven't healed from it, healed from it as of yet. Um, I'm still traumatized from the fact of uh, missing out on my education. Um, I went on to college uh, for my associates and you know I had problems with writing and you just feel like wow if I would have got this in high school I wouldn't have such a tough time. Um, but you do remember that um, as you grow older that these things come up and it all goes back to busing. If only if I would um, had my high school diploma. I mean a GED is fine but it just doesn't take the place of high school in classroom one-on-one -on -one learning um, experience. I feel like I was cheated out of my most important years of education. Not to forget what has happened, but forgive and to move forward in teaching their kids to make sure that they get theirs and not to let hurdles like that cause them to derail and go the opposite way, a negative way like we did. Um, it's kind of hard sometimes if you don't have that constant telling the kids, you know what, you can't use this as a crutch. You gotta move forward, you gotta, you gotta go around it. You can't lean on it and say, okay, well I can't go nowhere because of this and take that attitude or forget it or whatever. You, there's so much out there today that you don't have to accept it no more. My message would be is, you know, what happened happened. It was a terrible, horrific thing. We just need to learn from that and, and, and understand that when we want changes made, it, it can't be about race. It can't be about, you know, you're getting this and why should you get this and we're not getting this. I think we just have to be, learn to be more accepting of each other and understand that as a community, in Boston, for the most part, has a lot of low-income low communities we all need to come up from that. And, and uh, we're not gonna do it working separately, community by community. It has to be an uh, across the board thing. And, and people just need to be more understanding and accepting of each other. Boston is still a somewhat racist place. I mean, white people act, think that they own, they have, they're supposed to be in control. Black people are coming out of that because they realize that they are successful, they can be successful. I mean, it, the, the area has developed tremendously over the years, and um, if we all work together because we live here together and try to organize together, we might get, and get a, a, a better outcome. But how are you gonna do that when you have so much Separation, there's still separation. Coretta King leads a march of 5,000 from Boston Common to City Hall Plaza and argues that the issue in Boston is not busing, but racism. I would like to say to families that have children in Boston Public School, listen, three hours a month is not much. Use your resources. Analyze decisions that are made by the system. Please analyze the closing of the school. Why does Roxbury have to have more school closing than anybody else? Ask yourself some questions, seriously. Invite your neighbor over for coffee and talk with each other about it insist that these parents' organizations are real and not may believe.
I think competition is healthy. Because the Boston Public School is like a monopoly. You didn't have no choice. But now parents have choices. The Boston Public School is either going to die or they're going to change where parents want to send their children there. But it's healthy for parents to have choices. And, and I believe that children should be, go to their own neighborhood school. I really believe that busing disrupts our neighborhood. So, I mean, I'm excited that people are having the conversations. Um, I'm excited that we're actually dealing with um, something that made a significant impact on our city and on our school system. Um, and I just hope that it goes beyond healing and that people continue to do the necessary organizing work. Again, like I feel like this is, we're in the issue naming stage, um, pinpointing how, it, how people were affected, why people were aff affected, the effects now, like pinpointing all of that, but there's still a system that needs to be overhauled. When I reflect on the changes that were going on in communities and the discussions that were happening, when I was growing up and where we are today, I would have expected that we would be someplace different than where we are today. That we would not be um, dealing with the same issues, that it just hasn't shifted all that much in that time. And that it still makes um, a large difference to a child's life depending on where they're born and where they go to school in terms of what their opportunities are going to be. Now that doesn't mean that's, that someone doesn't get from X to Y um, because there are individuals that do, but that we really need to be looking at as a whole, as a whole community issue. Um, and for me, it really, I really look at it as it's a loss to the community when we only educate some children fully and don't educate all children fully. We all lose when that happens. About 125 white students walk out of South Boston High after a fight between 50 to 60 white and black girls. 30 black girls are sent home on special buses. I think I came into this interview uh, feeling like, I don't feel like I have anything to share. You know, I don't know nothing. Yeah, I drove a school bus a hundred years ago, you know, and, and I was just in it. And I'll just talk about my experience because that's what they're asking me to do. But I don't feel like I'm smart about anything. So I guess if I was going to talk to people in the audience for this film, I would want to say, what you got to share is what you got to share. And that's what we all got, bring it. We need everybody. We need everybody to bring what you can bring. You all got gifts and um, that's where our solutions are gonna come from. It's not about some kind of formalized expertise or license or election that somebody has. It's about everybody bringing what you can. I don't have a great deal of, um, of hope that it's going to get better anytime soon. Partly having to do with the fact that the, um, the high stakes testing has sucked up a lot of the, the quality time for providing real education to children. And teachers are now um, mandated almost to focus on preparing children to take tests. And that is not a way for children to learn and be well educated or to master academic subjects such as math, science, biology, uh, art. The elected officials have to rise to the occasion. I'm not saying they're not there, but if they're not, they have to rise to the occasion. And they have to do some listening too. And we've got to somehow get rid of that, all of those stuff. You know, I, I'm, I'm just convinced we can do it. But it's going to be, it's going to be a lot of pain along the way, and it's going to be like, you know, they're going to people be complaining and they're going to try to like build up a little bit here and build up there. But when suddenly everybody recognizes that everybody's being listened to, because then you don't feel alone. And then perhaps those groups can come together. But you've got to get the anger out. I think there'll be a lot of anger, but I think that'll be healthy in the long run, Scott.
I, I, this is my gut, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, but you, you can't quit. Once it starts, the process has to continue until you reach everybody in the city or you made a sincere, good effort, and then something good's got to come out of that. I mean, we have made tremendous strides, um, particularly, you know, in South Boston. I also participate um, in um, youth community youth dialogues on race. Um, and we've had, we've held them in South Boston, and there's been interest. Um, it's a different community today. Um, I certainly feel comfortable whether I'm going to the Andrew T Station, something I would have never done. Um, certainly not on foot um, using public transportation. So absolutely, and, and the same thing with Charlestown, um, Roxbury, Dorchester, um, I think there's a tremendous um, difference in terms of um, folks' ability um, to want to come together and to move beyond the stigma. Because um, it's not helpful for any of us when we travel, or if we have family or relatives come visit us, um, to have the stigma of um, Boston being a racist city. What we must do going forward, however, is to embrace inclusion. And that means that people of African-American descent cannot look down their noses at Latinos coming through the system. And the Latinos who've been here for a little while cannot look down their noses at the new ones hitting the door who can't speak a word of English. And those people cannot look down on the Asians who've decided to isolate themselves from the minority population because they somehow have managed to escape. We've got to stop it. We really do. And I think that the way we go in the future is about inclusion. It has to be, because we're all stuck here or have chosen to be here. We need to invest in our BPS while supporting charters, while supporting the religious schools, while supporting the private schools, you know, because parents can have choice. I turn around and say, choice gets eliminated if your Boston public schools are all performing. And I always say this, you know in the day I'm gonna know that we've made progress, I don't need to know data, statistics or anything. It's gonna be that day when folks in, you know, Beacon Hill and West Roxbury and others are trying to get their kid in the same schools I'm trying to get in Roxbury, do it just matter bad. And we ain't even talking about it. It's important to get education. Education needs to be first, but it needs to be for everybody, not just a few selected, not for the rich, not for, you know, um, who you know. It should be for everybody. So what, that one gets in Needham, should be able to get in Dorchester. It should be, and we need to speak up. Don't just accept things because they say it's gotta be that way. Make a change, speak up and do something about it. What I would say would, to them would be, all I want is my education. I'm not here to start any trouble. I don't want any trouble. I just want to learn. I just want my education and go home. That's what I wanted to say. That's what I want to yell out to the people that were on their rooftops with um, pellet guns or whatever the type of weapons they were holding and the rocks throwing. Leave me alone. I just want my education. I just want to learn and I just want to get home safe. <laughs>